because a decade or even earlier has been in this direction. And I think uh, it's very appropriate to listen to what is the, the overall scenario of global kidney disease, uh, not only the, the degree and the number of people who have chronic kidney disease, but also how uh, is the world going to manage it and how, what is the impact it's going to have in India and how are we going to cope with it and what are his uh, sort of options or directions that he would want the administrators and the medical community in India to do. So I thought this would be good. So it is going to be a thought provoking, I'm sure. And I hope we will have enough discussion as well. So Vivek, without any ado, thank you for accepting first and then at a short notice. And I'm, I'm very, very keen to listen to you again. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Professor K. Uh, thanks, everyone, and thanks, Puneet and, and the Steadfast team for putting this together. Uh, consistently, for the last several years at our initiative, uh, we started it as an experiment, but uh, it's uh, really very, very uh, pleasing to see that it has succeeded. And it succeeded beyond, uh, beyond our expectations, so much so that others are kind of copying it uh, as well, which is, uh, which is the best uh, uh, evidence of something working well. Look, uh, I know that uh, you are all studying to become a super specialist, right? I and mean, that's the term which is, uh, which is in common um, use, uh, that uh, once you become a general physician and then you become a, a logist of some sort or the other, cardiologist, gastroenterologist, nephrologist. And so as we become uh, more and more specialized, uh, again, something common that we know more and more about less and less. Uh, but what I am uh, going to do is to pull us back a little bit and rather than uh, take us deeper into uh, say specialized medicine, personalized medicine, et cetera, that everyone talks about, uh, into talking about the value of, uh, of, uh, uh, of routine treatments, right? Uh, routine treatments in trying to understand and address the burden of common diseases. Uh, and so uh, before we talk about kidney disease, I think we have to uh, uh, put this in perspective. And what is the perspective? The perspective is one of global health. And in the global health, we do know that um, the world's single greatest health challenge is how to provide healthcare to the 8 billion, almost 8 billion people who love, live on the planet. Out of these 8 billion people, about 5 to 6 billion do not have any reliable access to essential care, uh, any kind of essential care. And out of these uh, 6 billion people, almost half, which is 3 billion, will develop serious disease before the age of 60. And now we say before the age of 60, and to you who are really young, 60 may seem a, a long way off, uh, but uh, many of us are actually already on the other side of 60. And uh, this is something which reminds me of the time when I was a resident, which is again, a long time ago before most of you were even born, uh, where uh, the age of 60 to 65 was thought to be sufficient. And it was thought that, that a person has lived his or her life and it's, it may be time to go, but that's not the case anymore. So often you, you perhaps hear that kidney disease is a big public health problem. So what exactly is a public health problem? If someone asks you, I think you should be able to tell. Uh, and uh, these are four cardinal characteristics of any health problem, uh, which, which permits us to classify that health problem as a public health problem. So the disease burden of uh, that condition should be high. So what does it mean? It means it should affect many people and also that it should have recent, uh, recently increased and will likely to increase in future as well. The second characteristic uh, that we look for is its unfair distribution, which means that uh, people who are disadvantaged are more likely to be uh, uh, affected uh, both in the way they get the disease and in the way they're able to access treatment. Uh, the third uh, thing that we are looking for, or the third criterion that we are looking for is that the disease could be, should be preventable, uh, right? So it should, uh, and if we are able to put in place preventive strategies, we should be able to substantially reduce the burden of uh, that particular condition. And lastly, that that particular preventive strategy should not be in place already. So these are the four characteristics. 
we often talk about equity also that the the care should be available in an equitable manner to everyone so what is equity uh, and sometimes you might wonder uh, is it the same as in equality equity and equality are they the same so they're not the same in equality we try to uh, treat everyone equally but for achieving equity you need to not treat everyone equally but you need to treat people who are particularly disadvantaged uh, in in a different way so that they receive more so someone who is not disadvantaged uh, doesn't need to be treated in the same way compared to those who are disadvantaged right so uh, because uh, it is said that equity is a human rights issue and it is a failure to avoid or overcome inequities uh, that infringe of on fairness and human rights norm or the last bullet point that you have here. So let's look at uh, those four characteristics uh, that I had outlined in, in, in terms of definition of a public health problem and see where do we see kidney disease with it. So the first thing was that the burden should be high and it should have increased recently. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with these numbers that the global prevalence of chronic kidney disease is almost 850 million and the global incidence, which means the number of new individuals to develop chronic kidney disease uh, every year is almost 20 million or two crores. Two crore people around the world develop chronic kidney disease every year. And you can see the distribution of chronic kidney disease in terms of uh, uh, population prevalence in different uh, parts of the world in this particular slide. The other point, which is not often appreciated, and as a nephrologist, I think you should know it more than anyone else, and you should kind of trumpet this fact and become champions for it, that while uh, tremendous progress is being made in containing other chronic diseases, such as ischemic heart disease, stroke, okay. respiratory okay. diseases, etc. General Verma, if you can please mute yourself, it would be great. Uh, we can hear your family conversations. Can you, can you, meet, can you mute General Varma? Yes, sir. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So you can see that the age standardized mortality has fallen uh, between the 10 years that passed between 2007 and 2017 for ischemic heart disease, stroke, and COPD. But in fact, the uh, age standardized mortality to the kidney disease shown here uh, in the bar on the left side actually increased a little bit. So we are not making progress in reducing the mortality due to kidney disease, uh, which other specialties are doing very, very efficiently. So that's something which, uh, which should be a matter of shame for the nephrology community, et cetera. And what, what is the result of that? The result is that the number of people who are receiving kidney replacement therapy is going up as, uh, as was shown in this particular paper that we published in the Lancet uh, some years ago now, uh, where we looked at data from 2010 and we, we projected what will be the number of people who will require kidney replacement therapy in 2015, 2020, and so on. Now, the global burden of disease also tracks these data and they have shown that chronic kidney disease currently is the third fastest growing cause of death around the world. You know, so many of the uh, health conditions that you can see on the left side, uh, they are actually slowing down in terms of their contribution to the cause of death. Whereas the ones on the right side, you can see that they are increasing in terms of their contribution to the cause of death. And the red arrow points to chronic kidney disease, which is the third fastest growing cause of death around the world after Alzheimer's disease. And the second one is uh, uh, still tuberculosis, tuber uh, uh, sorry, hypertensive heart disease. So after these two, chronic kidney disease is the third fastest growing cause of death. And as a result of this growth, chronic kidney disease, which is currently number 16 in the list of causes of death, will become number five in the next about 18 years or so. The other point which is often not rec uh, recognized is this, this and, and this goes to the point of inequity, that this burden of chronic kidney disease leading to uh, the need for kidney failure treatment is inequitably distributed around the world. And you can see that uh, all the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, our own country included India, uh, many countries in Southeast Asia, some countries in Central America, et cetera, uh, really are not able to provide kidney replacement therapy to their patients. And what happens as a result? As a result of this, um, it, it is estimated, and we did that estimation, is that around seven to 10 million people need kidney replacement therapy every year, but only about a, uh, about a half to a quarter of these people are able to receive it. 
and everyone else dies. This is not something which will come as a surprise to us in India because we see this happening every day, but it is, uh, uh, it is quite shocking to people from other parts of the world where kidney replacement therapy is universally available. And so most of the people who receive kidney replacement therapy, as many as 93%, uh, live in high income countries or upper middle income countries. Right? These are basically the same point. So now let's look at uh, uh, earlier stages of chronic kidney disease. And now I'm going to present to you data from India. This is data from a study that we are currently doing uh, with, uh, with, in collaboration with the government of Andhra Pradesh in the uh, high CKD burden area. I'm sure all of you have heard the name of Uttanam. So we conducted a, a population-based survey in Uttanam and we found that the population prevalence of hypertension in the adults was 42%. Uh, that of diabetes was 13%. And the population prevalence of uh, uh, chronic kidney disease was as high as 21%. But what was even more striking that 90% of these people who we identified to have chronic kidney disease did not know before the survey that they had this condition. This is, this is not unique to India. This is actually present in many other parts of the world. And this is data from the Global Kidney Health Atlas. Uh, you must have heard the name, which is an initiative uh, run by International Society of Nephrology in which uh, global surveys are conducted every three to four years to find out what is the state of kidney care around the world. And here you can see availability of uh, simple tests to detect kidney disease, such as urine analysis, uh, creatinine testing, etc., And uh, let me just explain to you how, how, what, how this chart has been created. So this is what is called a spider plot. And in spider plot, countries around the world were divided into four groups, uh, high income countries shown here in the purple line, uh, upper middle income countries shown here in the dotted uh, green line, then lower uh, middle income countries shown here in the dotted uh, yellow line, and the low income countries shown here in the finely dotted uh, blue, dark blue line. And the closer to the center uh, a, line, a, a point falls, that means that that test is less available. And it won't come as a surprise to you that uh, tests, uh, all of the tests, even including simple tests like urine uh, and a simple urine analysis, qualitative urine analysis and serum creatinine is not available everywhere in the primary care level in low income and lower middle income countries, and even at secondary or tertiary care levels. Uh, you know, the other point for you to remember uh, is that we all are enamored of technology. We want uh, new technology to come in all the time. Uh, for example, hemodialysis uh, should be replaced with hemodia filtration, and we should be able to use the latest technology for, uh, for detecting donor specific antibodies or be able to give uh, maybe genetic uh, diagnosis, et cetera, to people. But I think we have to remember that introduction of any resource intensive intervention deepens prevailing inequities in the society. So let's just do this thought experiment. Uh, if hemodia filtration was to be uh, made widely available, who will access it? It is only the rich people or people who have access to uh, um, unlimited reimbursement will be able to access this treatment because it is more expensive. Uh, people who are poor will be further disadvantaged and therefore the inequity will increase. So that's something for us to remember. We also know that chronic kidney disease treatment is very expensive and almost 188 million people, which means 18.8 crore people experience catastrophic healthcare expenditure. What is catastrophic healthcare expenditure? This means that people are spending so much as a result of being ill, that they, uh, they are in the danger of falling back into poverty, or if they are already poor, uh, becoming even, even more poor. <coughs> and the number of people who experience this kind of catastrophic expenditure is largest for those who have kidney disease compared to those who have diseases uh, related to any other organ system. We also uh, should appreciate that the global burden of kidney disease is changing. Why is it changing? Uh, typically, I think if you go to meetings or if you talk to uh, um, uh, your colleagues, uh, we often just without thinking say that diabetes and hypertension is going to be the largest driver of kidney disease around the world. While that is true to a large extent, you have to also appreciate that this data from global burden of disease shows 
uh, you can see the contribution of diabetes in, in the blue sections of the bar and that of hypertension in this, uh, uh, in this mustard section, uh, that although high income countries, high middle income countries, and even middle social income countries have diabetes and hypertension as the main cause, as you go down to low middle income countries like India, or even poorer countries, uh, like many countries of Sub-Saharan Africa and, and countries like Afghanistan, et cetera, uh, the contribution of diabetes is much less. And other con conditions like glomerular nephritis, uh, which is shown here in the gray section of the bar, and even non-glomerular nephritis, non-diabetes, non-hypertension type of kidney disease, such as, in, uh, such as other infection-related kidney diseases, or kidney disease related to other unknown causes uh, are much more common in these countries. And, and this is also exemplified by uh, the demonstration of chronic kidney disease hotspots, which have been thought to be because of what is called CKD of unknown etiology or CKDQ. Uh, we don't know what is the cause of it. It is speculated that heat stress could be one such factor. We do know that out of the two organ systems, which are definitely known to be affected by increased ambient temperature, uh, heat, kidney is one of them. So kidney disease and cardiovascular disease that definitely, definitely worsened by increasing temperature, right? So as we battle with climate change, we can honestly predict that the burden of chronic kidney disease is going to increase in the coming years. And this is an interesting data from a one single hospital in Adelaide in Australia, where they looked at the number of admissions due to various types of kidney diseases and looked at its relationship with uh, the ambient temperature. And here you can see on the x-axis, the ambient temperature, and on the y-axis, you can see the number of admissions. So all kidney diseases, urolithiasis, kidney failure, which means uh, end-stage kidney failure, acute kidney injury, uh, earlier stages of chronic kidney disease, urinary tract infection, lower urinary tract infection, pyelonephritis, all of them increased with am increasing ambient temperature. Something really very striking, and we don't think about this, right? Uh, but this is this is real, and we need to be aware of it. We need to look out for it. Uh, we, we need to see whether the same kind of uh, trend is happening in our country as well or other parts of the world, and then we need to be prepared for it. We also know, going back to the point of inequity, is that uh, certain population groups are much more vulnerable to this kind of uh, climate change. So who are these people? Uh, it is the children. It is the elderly. It is those who have pre-existing chronic kidney diseases. It is people who have no choice but to continue to work long hours outdoors, such as manual laborers, construction workers, agricultural workers, etc. We also have a large proportion of our population popping pills, which include non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. They can just go and buy it from a chemist shop. But also drugs that we ourselves prescribe, like angiotensin blockers, diuretics, and now SGLT2 inhibitors. And we have to be mindful that we change our prescription based on, uh, based on the weather pattern. So I often uh, look at uh, uh, the prescription and review it. Uh, during summer months, I often cut down the dose of diuretics, and we need to tell people to be mindful of the fact that they might get dehydrated if they are taking angiotensin blockers as SGLT2 inhibitors. And in the end, those with reduced access to healthcare obviously are vulnerable. So then I hope I've been able to show to you that there is a vast unmet need of kidney disease treatment. There is a large undiagnosed and untreated population. And it's not a surprise, and I didn't show you data, that the number of nephrologists that is available to take care of these uh, patients is really very, very small. And so if we continue to depend on nephrologists or even physicians to provide healthcare to all of these people, we will not be able to uh, take care of their needs. We also know and recognize anyone who has practiced nephrology that there is a great variation in the quality of care. And we see prescriptions every day which do not make any sense. Despite the existence of guidelines, the delivery of guideline-based care is the exception rather than the norm. And finally, uh, the uh, care of people with kidney disease is a relatively high cost compared to their ability to pay. Uh, we published a paper uh, just a few months ago looking at treatment of early stages of chronic kidney disease and showed that uh, while we can expect it for people who are on dialysis, people even with early stages of chronic kidney disease have to spend a whole lot of money uh, for treatment. So then, 
what we need to do obviously uh, is to um, is, is is to prevent the development of kidney diseases uh, that that has been uh, emphasized a number of times and not something new that i'm telling you and we can do a number of things to reduce the progression of kidney disease which could include management of uh, underlying conditions like blood pressure and blood sugar but also lifestyle modification i don't know what you do but i spend about 5 minutes uh, with every patient in every visit reviewing uh, their lifestyle habits and their lifestyle and is there anything that we can do to um, help them um, you know uh, help them with their lifestyle for example uh, in maintaining healthy body weight and uh, regular physical activity uh, increasing the intake of fruits and vegetables but also making sure that their nutrition doesn't suffer uh, you i don't know whether you have had a chance to look at a, a paper that came out in uh, kidney 360 recently uh, but there is really very little evidence that protein restriction uh, can slow down the progression of chronic kidney disease and that we might be overdoing especially in india we also have data and that data we are analyzing uh, that shows that even otherwise uh, healthy indian population doesn't take more than 0.7 to 0.8 grams of uh, protein per kilo uh, per day you know we can also use generic treatments like angiotensin receptor blockade uh, or ace inhibitors statins and now sglt2 inhibitors so but we have to we have to reconceptualize the way we deliver healthcare as i said before uh, using only nephrologists or physicians to deliver healthcare is not going to work and so we need to go more peripherally and we need to engage other partners in healthcare delivery such as nurses such as even frontline healthcare workers and those of you who have seen healthcare delivery in villages and uh, are aware of the structure of the uh, indian uh, public healthcare system will know that uh, in the primary healthcare system uh, the 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 one that is the affected arm of the healthcare delivery are the so called asha workers or accredited social health activists uh, they are young women who are drawn from the community they they have the ability to get into patient homes and talk to them initially they were uh, charged only with care of pregnant mother and newborn children but increasingly their value in delivery of other types of care including chronic disease care is being recognized <clears throat> so you will ask the question how will they deliver care for kidney disease because they are not trained for it and you are exactly right uh, but we can provide them with tools and what are those tools we can give them checklists we can give them simple electronic decision support systems to allow them to identify individuals who are at high risk of developing various conditions uh, like high risk of developing cardiovascular disease chronic kidney disease etc you know Uh, and then they can uh, use what is called electronic decision support to come up with some recommendations uh, they they can also be trained to use simple point of care diagnostic tests and now we have um, a point of care serum platelet testing also available uh, through a device called istat right now it's very expensive but i'm pretty sure that uh, the cost will come down as uh, usage of such point of care devices increases or uh, an enterprising indian uh, you know, engineer will come up with a low cost device we also need to develop low cost drugs and they could be uh, fixed dose once a day combination and this is something which the pharmaceutical companies need to think more seriously about what are the rational fixed dose combinations uh, and typically when you use low dose of any given drug you minimize the risk of development of side effects this is something which is coming up in a big way uh, in In, in managing chronic diseases, especially multi-morbidity condition, and it that day is not far off when you will have a, a, a gout poly pill, you will have a cardiovascular disease poly pill, uh, you will have a chronic kidney disease poly pill, etc. So the first thing uh, that I mentioned was about using frontline healthcare workers, and how do we do it? This is a process called task shifting. so how do it what is task shifting task shifting is a rational redistribution of tasks amongst the healthcare workforce teams what it does is that it strengthens and expands the workforce to rapidly increase access to health services so at first level uh, we could shift some tasks from doctors to non physician clinicians and we don't have that cadre of clinicians 
in India, but uh, let me take my words back. Actually, we do. Uh, and they are a large part of healthcare deliveries, such as uh, Ayurvedic practitioners or homeopathic practitioners who, who work as uh, healthcare delivery professionals uh, in many hospitals. So they're not uh, formally trained physician in the modern system of medicine, but they can still, they are clinicians and they can uh, provide care. Uh, once we have done that, we can even shift it further down from uh, that, that cover of people to nurses with midwives, uh, then to community health workers, and eventually even to uh, members of the public, you know, that can be done. And we can do them, uh, we, can, we can empower them by uh, providing them with digital health technologies. And that digital health technology could look like this, uh, that you have someone, uh, it could be a frontline healthcare worker, or it, it could even be a trained community member as, a, as happens in Thailand. Uh, Thailand has a cadre of village health volunteers. They go and do screening, uh, they, they can enter data into a clinical decision support system, which allows automatic calculation of risk status. But at the same time, this data is also uploaded uh, in, on, on a web-based electronic health record, which could be reviewed by a doctor sitting somewhere else. They could be sitting several hundred miles away as well. And in most instances, uh, they don't need to do anything because the clinical decision support system also has provided with recommendations, but sometimes the doctors uh, can make their own judgment and, and you know, maybe intervene and suggest some changes. And then those changes will come back to the patient and, and will go back to even the front, frontline healthcare workers. So this is a program of work that, uh, that we uh, actually are implementing at the George Institute for Global Health. And we have actually shown in these papers that this, this, uh, this program actually works. So this, this is the first study which we published almost 10 years ago now, where we took these frontline healthcare workers and we gave them a paper-based checklist, asked them to identify uh, people who are at high risk of developing cardiovascular disease. They did not have to use their brains. They just needed to enter data into that checklist. And then we compared them with how the physicians identified that high risk population without access to that checklist. So we do expect that the physicians are trained for it, but to our surprise, we found that a healthcare worker with a checklist was actually superior to a physician without a checklist in identifying these, uh, these, health, uh, these people at high risk of cardiovascular disease. Then we were uh, encouraged by this and we went ahead and implemented this. Uh, this time we used an electronic clinical decision support. And again, we were, uh, we were pleasantly gratified to see that the number of people who who, who were started on appropriate blood pressure lowering medicines and achieved target blood pressure shot up quite significantly after implementing this program. And now what we have done is to um, convert that into a chronic kidney disease management module also. Uh, this is being implemented in Hyderabad, uh, not Hyderabad, in Andhra Pradesh, uh, rural area in Uttanam that I described to you earlier. And you can see some live pictures of there. And this is a, a picture of a frontline healthcare worker sitting in a very, very remote village. Although you can see there is a road coming to it, Pakka Road, but you can see that the, this, this, this person uh, lives in this thatched hut. And we were able to show that, uh, again, um, I won't uh, repeat uh, what I just said and, and we labor with, by going over each, uh, each cell in this particular chart, but people who are on blood pressure lowering medication, so optimal treatment, and achieved target blood pressure was, was quite significantly improved. And currently we are in the process of implementing this, as I said, uh, through funding from the United Kingdom Medical Research Council in rural communities of Thailand. Uh, in fact, Thai government is much more progressive and it has uh, allowed us to do that, which, is, which we have found somewhat uh, difficult or, or you know, less easy to do in India. Right, so, so this is the way we are doing it in Thailand. Uh, we, have, we have funding from Newton Fund of uh, uh, United Kingdom Global Challenge Research Fund, and also support from the Thai Medical Research Council. We are doing this in, in, uh, in 10 to 15 sub-districts. Uh, sub-districts is a block level, uh, what we call in India, in, in Thailand they call sub-districts. And each sub-district serves about 3,000 to 5,000 population. And uh, we have developed a network, a referral network between district hospitals and sub-district health centers. And the frontline healthcare workers and village uh, health volunteers fan out from these sub-district health centers. 
And this is the design of the, this particular study. Uh, we are doing it in 48 sub-district health centers. And uh, these sub-district health centers have been randomized uh, into those that will receive the intervention, uh, which is the, the technology-enabled healthcare intervention. And the other group uh, will, will be control villages. So this is how it will run. And these are some pictures uh, of, of uh, the team in Thailand. And this is the, uh, the app that we have developed. You can see this in Thai language. Uh, but eventually, look, uh, I'm just drawing this uh, presentation to a close. The way we can deliver a, a continuum uh, of care to people with kidney disease could look like this in future. So we, we can have a situation where there is a community or home-based um, screening for kidney disease, for other chronic conditions. Uh, this will be done by a frontline healthcare worker and the person is at home. At the same time, the frontline healthcare worker will be able to use point of care devices and will also check whether if someone has been started on treatment, whether they're continuing to treat, take treatment appropriately or not. Uh, people who are identified at high risk could be referred to primary healthcare center for some basic investigations to confirm diagnosis of chronic kidney disease. Uh, initial care planning can be done there. They can pick up medications from there. And whenever required, uh, the primary healthcare doctor will be, uh, will be able to refer them to district hospital. And in district hospital, more advanced investigations would be available. And the doctor sitting in the district hospital will make the decision to refer the patient to a nephrologist who may be available in the district hospital or may be available in a referral hospital. Uh, a person in a district hospital will also be able to do pre-dialysis preparation. End stage uh, will be able to discuss ESRD modality choice, such as uh, dialysis, transplantation, et cetera. And uh, with training, we'll be able to create vascular access or paternal dialysis access. A referral hospital, I don't have to say anything. You are all working in referral hospitals. You know what to do here. And the referral hospital will make the decision whether someone gets PD or hemodialysis or even supportive care. That's something which, which, uh, which one shouldn't forget. Uh, transplantation, of course, is the optimal treatment and whoever is suitable should be able to access transplantation, right? Uh, but then this requires a strong governance approach. Uh, we, need to have, uh, we need to have appropriate financing mechanism. We need to have appropriate policies. We should have registries. We should have reporting. We should have information systems, et cetera. So what I'm going to do is uh, uh, to stop here and invite comments from you or or anything else we, we, we may want to discuss. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek, for that exceptional uh, lecture as expected. And I am sure, uh, although this is not the typical kind of um, lecture that the students uh, would usually hear, but I thought that it does sort of uh, take them away from what they do on an everyday basis, but take them back, as you said, and then talk about that, what is the kind of care that will be required to give a wholesome kind of treatment to the whole population that is there. And I'm, I'm so pained that uh, you had to go to uh, Thailand and were not able to do this kind of a study in India. Although uh, I don't know, I have one question before I open it to other people. Uh, how does one improve advocacy with the government and what are your suggestions you I mean how does I, I don't know whether Indian society of nephrology itself and how does one engage uh, government into trying to understand this whole concept and and maybe uh, I remember at least having talked at one point of time with some health people administrators at that point that maybe we could hitchhike on a diabetes national program and just include creatinine and uh, urine albumin creatinine ratio. Will that happen, say, in the near future, or you think these point of care tests will take still some long time? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, that's the question we have all struggled with, right? Uh, yeah. I'm pretty sure that you also have thought of it again and again, as have I and as have uh, many other people. How to influence policy? Ultimately, the, the, the group, uh, uh, the, you know, the goal of everything that we do is to influence public policy. Uh, and, and that is where uh, the biggest struggle is because public policy is unfortunately not made simply on the basis of evidence. It's not a linear relationship. 
between the de development of evidence and um, uh, and um, develop or you know whatever the public policy is. Public policy is made by politicians. So public making policy is a political act. That's something which is important for us to remember. And politicians or policy makers often use heuristics or um, you know shortcuts to make decisions. For example, they may have seen someone with something and that made a deep impact on them. And uh, they, they might want to do some uh, you know, something to alleviate that. And I'm pretty sure that you are aware of uh, uh, now late, but then um, uh, finance minister and his decision to announce uh, national dialysis program uh, was shaped by per perhaps his personal experience also. Uh, so I think those are the kind of things but but you are right that it is it is important for us as stakeholders to uh, to create a coalition uh, and that coalition will require uh, will require people to come together and this should be uh, professionals such as the Indian Society of Nephrology but also I think members of the community people who are uh, in a position to uh, to to make to put pressure on the government because. I don't think the um, Indians or any society, uh, professional society, really is taken very seriously by the government. I think the government will take more seriously when they think that uh, a wider section of the community is exercised about it, which is what happened in Uttanam, right? Because it's, it was only when the people started speaking up and it became a political matter that the government wanted to invest uh, any money. Yeah. You you are aware, uh, Dr. K, of how uh, the Utanam project came came yes. about, uh, yes. right? So I think we need to develop those skills. Uh, and uh, advocacy is a skill. Advocacy is not something that comes naturally. Uh, but for us as uh, as a community, especially those to um, those who are leaders, uh, advocacy is a, is is a duty and a responsibility as well. The General Verma, you want to make. A comment or a... I, I think um, that, that that's a very ideal thing uh, what uh, Professor Jha has advocated and it is very interesting that in Thailand it is being followed. Uh, I don't know because it's it, it's not an easy thing at so many levels they have gone from uh, root levels to primary health center to district center and beyond. Uh, these are the ideal things. I don't know. Uh, unless the community gets involved, it will not be easy to do those things. But that is the only way that if you want to prevent chronic kidney disease, possibly that is the only way to do it. But I don't know whether it is being possible no. in India, whether it will become possible in India. But maybe the effort has to be put by nephrologists and at community level, I think. Yeah, I think it's possible because at Udnam, you can see what Dr. Ja and his team at George Institute have been able to do. And I think that's, that's something remarkable that, and he has shown you the data also coming from Udnam as to that when you transfer this information and just, see, many of us will not believe that this will happen. And I think this data is very convincing to tell you that, uh, that this can be done. It's only that it requires a specific effort. Obviously, yeah. community community needs to be educated. And I think Dr. Jai and his team, I know from personal experience, has put in huge amount of effort in education of the population itself in that area and why, why it is important for them to get involved into this. And that's why they see the success of that project and giving you the kind of data that they have produced, showing that it is possible to do it, actually. It's not that it cannot be done in India. It can be done in India, but it needs, obviously, greater effort. If government was willing, then that would definitely help. Yeah. And I, I think government of Andhra Pradesh, at least in Udhanam, probably has provided some kind of uh, administrative help to uh, Vivek, and uh, Vivek can talk about it much better. Yeah, I won't want to go into details of that, but look, I mean, these are a few thoughts about health policy, and uh, we do need to uh, to try and tick every single uh, box around these uh, bullet points. You know, uh, ultimately, it, it is the values of the society. What do we value? Do we value health, uh, or do we value something else? 
uh, if we value health then we'll invest in it if we don't then it will remain somewhat on the back burner you know so and and the budget priorities will be decided by that so you know uh, uh, and research evidence uh, doesn't easily translate into policy because policy makers have goals other than clinical effectiveness uh, because uh, they they look at uh, the uh, the various other considerations that they have in mind uh, etc uh, they they sometimes dismiss the evidence as irrelevant uh, because they think that it has come from a different sector there's a lack of consensus there is other type of competing evidence such as like i said personal experience local information uh, sometimes the politicians think that the social environment is not conducive to change uh, and they are somewhat uh, uh, not always uh, not only convinced with the research also because researchers don't have good communication skills and the research outputs that we produce are produced in such a way which is not uh, necessarily relevant to policy makers uh, we also don't have any centralized uh, site for accessing information and this is where dr kher your point about perhaps the indian society of nephrology coming together and and developing such a repository would be helpful uh, there are not many opportunities for researchers and policy makers to meet so uh, again indian society of nephrology for them to have during the annual congress a policy forum uh, as the international society of nephrology does very very effectively uh, would be useful and uh, of course we need to continue to educate the politicians so that political will to use evidence will be important so what we need is uh, you know change in researcher attitude funder understanding and also change in the way research is conducted so there are a number of things that we need to do to influence policy any anyone else who wants to make a comment or so or some question or any do it is not related to the topic uh, procedure in in your view now what is the future of sorry it is uh, going off the way what is the future of peritoneal dialysis in india i think the future of peritoneal dialysis uh, uh, one nation one dialysis policy will be announced on october uh, on august 15 uh, just wait for it and uh, i know with uh, some uh, inside knowledge because i have been consulted that peritoneal dialysis is going to be a big part of this one nation one dialysis scheme uh, the modalities are being developed it is being developed by by the government it just so happens that uh, the current executive uh, director of the national health mission uh, one of the sections of uh, national health mission is a very very rational a public health uh, professional from pgi chandigarh so we i have known him for a long time we have worked together he was the uh, he was the co-author with me on the paper that we published uh, earlier uh, uh, this year on the cost effectiveness of peritoneal dialysis so uh, in, in the public sector the peritoneal dialysis will be will receive a big push but i think uh, uh, where it will encounter the biggest resistance is our community Uh, the nephrologist community is going to fight tooth and nail against peritoneal dialysis uh, and we will see who wins no oh, i think I, i i i unfortunately the peritoneal dialysis training to the young nephrologists at the moment is is dismal and unfortunately that's that's true in most of the centers except few good pd centers and i am sure that's one of the reasons where uh this might fail but i think we i i i would agree that i i think pd should be promoted there's no doubt about that and i think we should yes i i think no, uh, even, vivek, even in us the facilities for pd training are not there in yeah, yeah, yeah. the fellows yeah, yeah. are not exposed to that yeah, yeah, yeah. today yeah. except in government institutions i think majority of the private institutions have never practiced pd Yeah, and yeah. as uh, rightly said it is basically nephrologist it is the fault lies purely with us yeah vivek one more question how far do you think is this digital technology or point of care uh, availability of creatinine urine albumin creatinine ratios and all that at the moment they are available but they are very expensive so how what do you think You, any any information that can we take yeah. a jump like we took in the mobile uh, sort of is, jumps no, in is, communication yeah thanks it is inevitable uh, yeah. it's only a question of when will it happen 
uh, and uh, people are working on it. So in, in the Netherlands, now they have developed a point of care urine albumin treatment ratio test. What they do is that they send this test kit by posts to every citizen and they can, you know, uh, so they don't have to go anywhere. So you have to make it as easy as possible for an individual. So if you ask the individual to come to even a primary health care center and collect it, you know, they will see uh, because many people, they have, uh, they have some, something to do every day. They work on daily wages and so on. So that is not going to be possible. So we have to reduce the friction. And that is where the community healthcare workers uh, will play a key role. Uh, because they can very easily enter the homes of every uh, every patient uh, or every community member, etc. And uh, point of care uh, uh, devices are being developed, and and they will be used. I don't think these point of care devices have to be uh, have to be exceptionally accurate, because what is important, as you and I know, uh, is not an individual value but the trend. We need to follow the trend. As long as the trend is in the right direction, we are okay. Even if the serum treatment value is off by 0.1 or 0.2 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, so uh, this, this, is, uh, this is happening. This is happening everywhere. And the value of this has been recognized even in high income countries. Uh, although it's most relevant to low income countries such as ourselves. I think there are a few questions also yeah. coming in, in chat. Yeah, it says that PD consumables made in India or hemodialysis consumables made in India. I think once they announce this, I'm sure they are at the moment uh, having people who are making uh, these consumables in India, they're going to promote them because they've increased the uh, excise and the export, uh, the import duties on many of the dialyzers which are being imported, say Fresenius dialyzers and other dialyzers. Nipro has set up a plant of making hemodialysis equipment here. And I am sure uh, there are other Indian companies which have started making uh, hemodialysis components, uh, at least in India. And I, I think they're going to get a big boost from the government in this policy. What do you think, Vivek? No, I agree with you. I, uh, <laughs> this may not come as a surprise to everyone that the cost of producing one peritoneal dialysis fluid bag is less than uh, less than $1, uh, you know, uh, 99 cents or 95 cents, something like that. But it is sold in the US for, uh, for a much, much larger amount. And similarly in India as well. In, in the cost in India is not as high as it is in US, but still quite substantially high. Uh, so it can be easily produced at very low cost, but it is, uh, again, I'm, I'm trying to be gentle here, but it is the pharmaceutical company which has kept the price artificially inflated uh, to the level that it is. You are also right about the cost of consumables of hemodialysis. And there are uh, often people talk about producing low cost hemodialysis machines, but do, they don't realize that the cost of hemodialysis machine is a, is a tiny, tiny component of the lifetime cost of dialysis of an individual. Yeah. So I don't worry about the cost of hemodialysis machines at all. I worry about the cost of consumables. I worry about the cost of uh, water that we use. Those are the kind of things that we use in massive amounts. Uh, we, we produce a lot of waste, etc. So that is where we have to do. And there is this, this unhealthy push about a single use dialyzer. I don't understand and the rationale for that. Uh, if someone can afford a single use dialyzer, fine. But I don't see any reason why the public healthcare system has to push for a single use dialyzer. Because I have, uh, I have been told that uh, even uh, publicly funded programs are now tendering, saying that the, you know, uh, the dialysis company should use dialyzer only once. There is no evidence, uh, scientific evidence, that, mod that dialyzers created using modern uh, materials uh, you know, uh, deteriorate with multiple uses, et cetera. Someone needs to generate that kind of evidence. And, uh, and the point of uh, central government taking up the job of production, I don't think it's the job of the government to take up these kind of things. It is, it is uh, the uh, private entrepreneurial community that needs to do it. The job of the government is to facilitate this. Just like how were, how were COVID vaccines produced? They were not produced by the government. They were produced by private uh, entities because the government supported uh, their development. 
So once the government identifies a priority area, it should support its development and it, you know, it, it committed funding in uh, for uh, development of COVID vaccine through in the US through Operation War Seed. Although the, the motivation behind uh, committing that funding was what was not necessarily very altruistic, but then that allowed the vaccine production to take place. And similarly, I, I, I think we, we, we are in a position where uh, enterpri enterprising uh, private entities should come up with this. And I've put a, a, a link here in the chat. This is a, a series of tweets that I put out. So there is a company called LN Medical, which is doing exactly this. It is producing a, a low cost peritoneal dialysis solution. Uh, it's very close to coming into clinical trials and hopefully it, if it does, then perhaps it will provide some, uh, some competition to the existing market. Mm -hmm. is, the government, is the government, what you, in your study, what you had uh, mentioned, that possibly if the cost of the bag comes down to around 70 bucks or so, that is around $1, I think then PD becomes cost effective in both the models. Is the government trying to do that? What you are saying on 15th August, uh, are they trying to reduce the cost of flute? No, no, the government is not doing anything. The government is, I think the one thing that the government can do um, is by aggressively negotiating the price with the industry. Uh, because if uh, they do strategic purchasing, the, the purchase in large bulk, uh, then it makes sense for the industry to reduce the price. But I know that the industry, some, some of the industry have their head in, in the sand. Uh, and uh, they may not necessarily see the value in this, but we'll see how it goes. I am, of course, not in the government, so I can't say. Yeah, another question, interesting one. How can a tertiary care nephrologist or a clinician be of help in such a program and increase equity? Yeah. Well, I think uh, this is from Dr. Pranav Jha. So, uh, Pranav, you know the answer to this. I think, you know, uh, we, we all can make our individual efforts, which is which is laudable. But in the end, the biggest service provider is, is the government. Uh, and it is the government who, who, for better or for worse, because the government has taken it upon itself. And so the responsibility lies with the government and we, we, should, we should continue to make that point. Uh, if we try to say that you know, others should take on, the government will be very, very happy to shed that responsibility and put it on your shoulders. That's, that's just one point. But can tertiary care nephrologist or clinician be of help in such programs and increase equity? Of course. I mean, you've heard Dr. Mani's uh, uh, initiative in, in Chennai, but these are individual level initiatives. They don't, they don't have sustainability. And what we are looking for is to develop sustainable programs. If a, a, a group of uh, nephrologists or, or clinicians, they don't have to be nephrologists, uh, but clinicians, like-minded nephrologists, like-minded clinicians can come together and, uh, um, and, and put in place a program. I don't know if you are aware of uh, a, a program in Chhattisgarh. So there are uh, at least two or three programs uh, called Jan Swast Sayo. Uh, they, they are run by AIMS graduates. So uh, they, they're, all treat, they're all trained at AIMS, uh, but they, they got the calling of public service and um, some of them even were faculty members at AIMS and they gave that up and went and worked in rural areas of Chhattisgarh and they've been doing it for the last 20, 25 years in primary health care delivery. So I think that is, that is uh, one way. I don't think it is a practical solution because uh, most nephrologists, most uh, clinicians are unlikely uh, to, uh, to see this as their calling and, and, and give up uh, what they're doing right now uh, and, and engage in public service full time. But even if we are able to do this part time or we support those who are doing it, I think that's the way to do it. Uh, making yourself available even for some time in, in the kind of program that I described where a physician or a doctor doesn't have to be on site, but they can provide their expertise even through uh, you know, remote mechanisms. Uh, if, if you can donate one, one hour um, every week or two hours every week, that can help sustain such programs. What are the most challenging issues that programs sure. face in India? Uh, well, the such pro like I said, um, these kind of programs need to be embedded in the existing healthcare systems. Uh, programs run by individuals or even uh, small groups 
are not likely to be sustainable. For example, the uh, the Jan Swast Sahyog um, initiative that I mentioned a few minutes ago, it is based on uh, the the drive of a few individuals. Uh, over time, these individuals will grow old, right? And they will no longer have the energy to do what they are doing today. Uh, maybe they will, uh, they will, they would have inspired people who will come and join them. But what needs to happen is that uh, the governments need to take over such programs. That is the biggest barrier. Uh, I see uh, the limitation in scaling up of such programs and the uh, scaling up uh, needs to have involvement from the public health system, uh, which is the biggest challenge. Uh, everything else is, um, uh, it's possible to overcome. Uh, for example, we say, the, and one more thing I would like to say here, which is somewhat unconnected uh, to your question, is that often when these kind of discussions take place, we say, oh, we will do education programs. Uh, I can tell you that education program is the most, one of the most inefficient ways of bringing about change. Uh, education pro programs about anything education pro programs about increasing disease donation. Those things are not going to work. You have to make systemic changes, changes uh, which, which change the way care is delivered or the way organ donation is, is managed, et cetera. That needs to change uh, for there to be a significant change in organ donation uh, rates, et cetera. And similarly, in the way healthcare is delivered, uh, we need to make systematic changes in, uh, in our healthcare service. So I think since there are no more questions, uh, I think it's also been more than an hour now. So I think we should give rest to Vivek as well. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Vivek, for that was very uh, inspiring as well as illuminating talk. And I, I'm sure that uh, it takes us somewhat back from what we do on a day-to-day -day practice, but tells us the global perspective as well as the, the perspective of what is the magnitude of the disease that is prevalent in our country and how many people we we are serving a very small percentage of the population we do take care but there's a larger population who's not able to get care and i think that's that's a sobering kind of a thought process and it's important to keep this at the background and do whatever efforts one can do to uh, help in providing some hand into getting it to an equitable kind of care is going to be a hard task, but that's, I think, small steps and some background education, like what you said, although you said that education will not bring the change, but I think at least this sort of thought process sometimes does get you back to your roots, that that's where you belong and that's what oh. may happen. So uh, perhaps I didn't explain myself clearly. Education is important. There is no doubt that education uh, is critical to any initiative. But education alone is not going to change. Yes. You know? It needs to be accompanied by systematic change. Systematic change. Uh, right? Because otherwise they do education, everyone goes back home. They don't know how to use that education. So there needs to be a platform where people can utilize the newly acquired education. Very true. Very true. So thank you very much. And I think I would thank all the other participants who, who joined us today. And there were many nephrologists, I think I could see, who were joined. Uh, lesser number of students. Initially, students were there, but I think they disappeared by the time you finish your lecture. So I think they thought that this may not be of that importance to them. This question is not going to. But I think uh, many of the people who are going to be examiners, yeah, they might put this in theory as well as ask them something about this in the exam. They don't realize that. Anyway, so thank you very much, Vivek. And thanks, uh, General Verma and uh, others who came. And thank you very much. It was very, very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you also to PSNL for uh, the internet staying stable post. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Important. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Puneet, and right. Steadfast. Yeah. I Thanks. must say that steadfast has remained set for steadfast uh, as far as mm. uh, these lectures are concerned. And I think uh, we've been doing it. And as Vivek said, that it's been very, very satisfying to see that uh, we've done well. And uh, now there are many people who are, who are doing the same. And uh, we're very happy that they're doing it. And uh, But 
Yes. Yeah, we and and we we feel flattered. Imitation is the best form of flattery. That's that's right. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. Sir. Thank you. It's Vivek. indeed totally okay. our pleasure, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Good night. Good night.